next on Startup. We head to Minneapolis, Minnesota to talk to Bob, a man of many careers who started Above the Falls, a kayak rental and tour company that takes people up the Mississippi River. Then we head over to Madison, Wisconsin to talk to Henry, Andrew, and Giotto, three college buddies who love beer and online technology and started Mobcraft, the world's first crowdsourced brewery. All of this and more is next on Startup. It all starts with an idea, and everyone has them. In the world of business, where you choose to take your idea determines where your idea will take you. Baker College is proud to support Startup and those who dare to share their ideas with the world. The American small business was built on one thing, relationships. And every time a customer walks through the door, a new one begins. Pay Anywhere was built to help entrepreneurs do what they do best. So keep loving what you do. Just get paid for it. Pay Anywhere. The Chevrolet Volt, an everyday electric car with gas for longer trips. The nature of things to come. Oh, Chevrolet, find new roads. American Express is proud to support startup and the millions of small businesses that put in the hard work to be open for business in neighborhoods across the country. My name is Gary Bredo, and I'm a documentary filmmaker and an entrepreneur. The economy is in less than perfect shape, and when the jobs go away, there's nothing left to do but get up and get creative. And there are people all over America doing just that. It's estimated that up to 85% of new businesses fail, so I'm going coast to coast to hear the personal stories of the people who beat the odds and started a successful business from the ground up. This is Startup. I'm on 3rd Avenue North in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm going to talk to Bob, who created Above the Falls Sports, a kayak tour company that takes people on a wild adventure down the mighty Mississippi River. Let's go hear his story. The Mississippi River is one of the world's major river systems in size, habitat, diversity, and biological productivity. More than 50 cities rely on the Mississippi for their daily water supply. And the Mighty Miss has always been a source of revenue. As more than 60% of all grain exported from the U.S. is shipped on the Mississippi through the Port of New Orleans and the Port of South Louisiana. Bob has always appreciated the river, but when he found a way to combine a small business concept with his favorite sport, kayaking, Above the Falls was born. Tell me uh, where we are right now. What is this shop and some of this, all this fun stuff around us? Well, what's really cool about this shop is that I live right on the other side of the track. So I've been going past this building forever since 2003. I have a friend that works next door who's a furniture, fine furniture builder. Okay. He and I worked together back in the 70s on furniture. Mm -hmm. He continued to work his furniture. I was fired for bad belt sanding. Yeah. This used to be a place for motorcycles. So they used a rental motorcycle rental shop out of here. When those guys cleared out, I came over and I talked to my friend Richard. And I said, you know, I wonder if they'd be interested in leasing this to us for a little boat business. Yeah. So it's perfect for what we do. We call this our boat livery. I grew up in New Jersey, and I uh, graduated from college in 1972. Where'd you go? I went to Williams College in Massachusetts. I played hockey. No kidding. And the people I played hockey with were Minnesotans. When my wife and I were thinking about what are we going to do next, uh, we, she's from Chicago, I'm from the New York area. Yeah. We didn't want to stay in those particular areas, mm -hmm. so we came, visited here. We went up to the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. We hung around the city where we have this great university and a tremendous college community, yeah. and we just stayed here. So what, is, what are some of this stuff here? Is this just your life jackets and some equipment that you send out when people come in to rent? When it's fall, when it's spring, we like people to have clothing that is uh, weather appropriate. Mm -hmm. So we have windbreakers. We have these are called uh, uh, dry tops. We have semi dry tops. We have dry bottoms. These are wetsuits. So when our group goes out, we have uh, training early in May okay. with our guides. So when we go out early in May, it may be warm. The weather may be warm, but the water will still be cold. Everything that a person needs to go out on that water with us. 
we have, whether it's sunscreen, whether it's sunglasses, whether it's hats and so forth and so on. The first bridge built across the Mississippi River was in 1855, and the first railroad bridge finished a year later in 1856. How many total do you have? What it we take have, to fill up this business? We have, we say we have capacity to take 40, 40 people out at once. What do the boats run? Uh, well, the, the way it works is for us, um, we actually sell our boats at the end of the year because oh. in order for us to survive the winter, this is a, only a three, we, we're open six months, but we're really a three month operation. Uh, that boat I think retails for eight ninety nine. dollars Okay, what do you sell it we for? Ended up, we end up selling it for... Um, Five-ish? No. Uh, sometimes, five twenty-five to six fifty. Okay. Now I'm trying to do math in my head here, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I'm thinking that the with the money that you make over the tours over the three months maybe slows down a little the other three, right? You got six oh, months oh, yeah, total, yeah, yeah, but yeah. you got we, three we really hardcore three, good yeah, months. Yeah, yeah. So you're making up that money and you're selling at what a 20, 30 percent loss, 30 percent loss on the boats. Well, then you have to go rebuy them. Again. You remember I buy at wholesale. Okay, so that's the cost of what I, I, they would I, I, cost the normal. Yeah, person. the retail okay. price. So I'm selling them above wholesale. You're, you're, I'm making profit. You're making profit on the boat. How how does one just become a tour? There's got to be insurance and liability ah. and stickers. Ah, well, and, oh okay. yeah, I covered all my bases to make sure I wasn't doing something that was not permitted. Got it. The big costs of entry are um, insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, there are very few in, in, uh, underwriters that will insure businesses like Outfitters, and so we have to jump through some hoops. Uh, we have to follow policies and procedures. We have to, right now we have four of our guides are up north uh, for American Canoeing Association um, certifications. Mm -hmm. So most of our guides have some form of certification. We all have first aid and CPR and so forth. So we are following all those rules. How many people are you employing here every, every season? We have probably six to eight people who make money doing this. And it's contract, I would assume. No. Uh, we were contract, now we're a seasonal part-time employer because of insurance. Okay. Because if, uh, if they're contractors, then, then they supposedly have their own insurance. We don't count on kids who are the age, you know, 20 to 30 years old to have insurance. <laughs> the North American Inuits stretch animal skins over driftwood to make some of the earliest known kayaks about 4,000 years ago. I had a little bit of experience guiding and kayaking, so I asked him if I could jump on as one of his guides, and it's been a blast. I, and this summer he asked me to come back, and I do a little bit of guiding, but I help him out a lot in the shop. So is Minneapolis a pretty like outdoorsy city in your opinion? Do you guys utilize the Mississippi River quite a bit? It's, a, it's very outdoors centered. Um, but people tend to use the paths along the river a little bit more than the actual river itself. So that's something kind of cool about, about the falls is that we actually get people on the river to see a different aspect of the Mississippi and the skyline and stuff like that. I took a, uh, a kayaking course and have a place on water too, so I'm a water guy. Can we get out there today? Show me some stuff. Oh yeah, we'd kayak. love to do that. We'd love to show you how we portage. Is that you when know? you get out and carry your yeah, canoe? Yeah, you carry your canoe, you put okay. beer, gr bear grease on so that the flies don't bug you and so forth. So that's what <laughs> we do. We wrote the plan spring of 2009. We started advertising July of 09. We leased the space in August of 09. We opened the shop the third week in August, ran through October, uh, the wettest, coldest October on record. And, uh, and didn't get a lot of business, but the whole idea was just basically a, to do a, um, you know, pilot. One, one of the really neat things in this particular little den of wilderness in the city, it's what we call our urban refuge. And we have fox in here, we have raccoons, we have uh, fox dens. So every now and then you'll see a fox and the kits will be rolling around. We have Although we don't like raccoons, there are raccoon nests in here. So you see a lot of the baby raccoons and the mother will get all upset and do a lot of hissing. So what we're going to do, if you guys don't mind, we'll head into this tunnel. It's about uh, 1890s. Um, part of it is stone uh, block and uh, other parts of it uh, basically has been uh, bore. It's, it's bored out limestone. So anyway, here we go. So uh, you've got your light on. That's yep, good. I do. 
So if anybody chooses not to go any further, you just let me know. Okay. I'm, uh, wow, this is so cool. This does not <laughs> feel like we're in, uh, we're in the middle of the city, Bob. No. So this is what we're, you know, what we're all about is urban adventure. Um, another thing that's really cool is every now and then you'll get a beaver in here and you'll be going in the tunnel and all of a sudden you'll hear a... <laughs> <laughs> what does the future hold for you and for Above the Falls Sports? Well, what my original idea was um, to create a business to get it to a point where it was generating revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, and once it got to generating that revenue, uh, sell it over a period of time and use it as a, as a part of a portfolio. So thank you so much for You're talking welcome. with us yeah, today. Yeah. I appreciate it. There are a million ways to start a business, but how did Bob do it? Let's find out. He started with around $10,000 in the bank and a credit score of 750. First year sales were around $35,000 and the business operated at a loss. It cost Bob approximately $48,000 to open his business, in which he used his own personal funds. And the one word that he would use to explain what it really takes to make it in business is passion. In order to keep your business afloat, you have to keep your head above water. And sometimes if you don't just jump right in, you can let your dreams just get washed ashore. Remember, every decision that you make in business can be sink or swim, but it looks like Bob is in it for the long haul. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for Above the Falls. I'm on Helgeson in Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm gonna to talk to Henry, Andrew, and Giotto, the guys who created Mobcraft, a small craft brewery that lets you decide on the next beer that they're gonna release. Let's go hear their story. A study by Social Impact observed that almost half of Fortune 500 companies have used crowdfunding for various reasons. And in the last three years, the crowdfunding economy saw an epic 300% growth to over $5.1 billion. As crowdfunding can essentially be used in any industry, Mobcraft has found a way to capitalize on giving people the right to vote. For their favorite beer, of course. I want to learn a little bit about each of you individually. I uh, grew up in Denver, Colorado, came to Wisconsin in 2003, and I coincidentally started a skateboard store when I was in high school. So okay. I got a really young, early age start to being an entrepreneur. Gotcha. Um, ran that business for a few years, um, was awarded a scholarship to go to school at UW-Whitewater, um, where I studied entrepreneurship a little bit further. Clarify what studying entre entrepreneurship actually means. So I can't say that I learned anything, but I did learn how to learn and that base knowledge. So it's more of a business base knowledge, I think, with access to how you go through starting a business. I, too, went to UW-Whitewater, um, studied entrepreneurship and marketing. Um, but before that, I've sort of been a serial entrepreneur doing recreational uh, employing, uh, mowing lawns, uh, that sort of stuff, yard work really came into the, the beer side of things um, more right after college. I started working at Capital Brewery here in Mid or near, near us in Middleton here. Okay. And uh, really for, sort of fell in love with it. Uh, right after college, what'd you do next? So we were, within the university, they had a business incubator that we went through. Mm -hmm. uh, so we spent the year before we graduated and our summer after graduation being in this business incubator. Started off working on a completely different business kind of decided not to go through with this one, and then we settled on the idea of Mobcraft. So it was in that business incubator, we started the, you know, milling through the idea and doing some of the planning. Um, went out and got jobs out in the real world. I lasted for all of, you know, six, eight months. And was it specifically, uh, like, your idea, your idea, or assignment? Like, how did, how did it was the a actual... Whole, it was a whole gamut. First off, we, we wanted to open up a brew pub, because we thought that'd be sweet. But we looked at the financials of opening it, and it was like a, you know, a million costs. and a quarter to do this. And we're like, oh, we don't want to do a restaurant. Yeah. So we thought, we still have making beer. We still have business. What can we do that's not so capital intensive right off the bat, but still be a really unique brewery that doesn't exist anywhere else? The, the name. Who thought of the name? I don't think we know. 
<laughs> it was one of us. It, but but okay. it came down to the fact that it's a very <laughs> intuitive share, like yeah. name because a mob of people helping to craft beer. Even the logo itself is we're talking to the mob, the mob's talking to us, and we create a beer. You know, somebody has some weird, crazy, harebrained idea of a flavor of beer that they want. They go, they submit it, and people vote for it. If it wins, you make it. Yep, I mean, that's pretty simple. It in a nutshell, yep. yeah. After we ran a homebrew pilot of the concept, mm -hmm. we decided that we needed to take this to the next level and actually do it commercially. So we started doing all of our background research on how you start a brewery, from permitting all the way up to gaining that equipment. Okay, and when you say the pilot, that's you guys building the, the website and iWeb, mm -hmm. putting it out to people, and then just making like five gallon buckets full of yep. beer and giving it to people. Yep, just doing it What was the a, initial a reaction? Milk. Oh, it was fun. Like the, the first beer that somebody suggested, she, we worked in the same office in the business incubator and she drank a strawberry basil lime tea that she just muddled up everything and then drank gotcha. the tea and she's like, can you make this into a beer? And we're like, <laughs> yeah, that'd probably be an awesome jefe. So we made this, we used basil for the bittering instead of hops and then we put, you know, strawberry and, and lime in it as well. How did it taste? It was tasty. It was good. You're out of the pilot phase now, mm -hmm. getting into, okay, we got to turn this into a real thing, commercial business. What happened first? So that's when we started asking some friends who brewed around Madison, you know, how can we make this happen? One guy said, you should go over and talk to Paige at House of Brews. He only brews about two days a week. He's probably got excess capacity that you guys could move in there. So that's the building that we're standing in right now. We came in here about a year ago and brought in one seven barrel fermentation tank to start doing this, again, on a sort of like a pilot model, instead of all the overhead of starting the brewery, just putting in one tank with, um, you know, with something that we could afford to buy on our, on our savings and then just kind of get start building a buzz around the concept. After you were able to set up shop in here, uh, I would assume that you'd take that five gallon bucket and just get scaled up to the large fermentation tank, right? Yeah, kind of. There's a couple of things that you factor in, hop utilization and a bigger tank with more surface area, boiling temperatures does, does a little bit different. So it's not an immediate Chemistry. scale up, but our brewer and other founders a microbiology guy and just knows it like the back of his hand. And I actually met Giotto and Henry through my brother who went to school with them. Me and my brother got Henry into home brewing and so we kind of like taught him how to make, we helped him make some wine and then we taught him how to home brew in college and I guess right. that's kind of really where it all started. So are you, are, are you doing what you love? Are you, you seem pretty happy about what you're doing. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Dream come true, huh? There's nothing I would rather be doing right now. There's honestly. a lot of different fates that, that, uh, that exist for people when you come out of college or when you're doing things. What am I going to have to do for work? What's my job I knew what I be? wanted to do already. I knew you exactly did. what I wanted to do. Can I try stirring it? It's absolutely. One of, it's, it's one of my bucket list things No, here. absolutely. Here. You get into it? I've had it. So I'll dump and you can keep mixing. Okay. And where, do you, uh, where are you sourcing these ingredients from? Um, as locally as possible, as often as possible. What do you see for the future? Here, for you guys. Here, personally? Or? Yeah, you, well, you personally and also for Mobcraft. I see nothing but good things. Um, at least I hope so. Um, I'm not looking to get rich or famous. I'm just looking to make a living. So I and mean, make good beer. And make good beer. And honestly, that's all I can really, that's all I can really ask of myself and ask of Mobcraft is we continue to make good beer and people continue to drink it. The world's oldest known recipe is for beer and zithology is the study of beer. How long have you been a Mobcraft fan? For probably about a year and a half. And what is it about their, their beer that's different from, from other microbrews or small craft breweries? So the concept is that consumers vote on the beer that's made, so it's always very interesting. Uh, for example, this one is uh, carrot cake ale. Um, it's very interesting flavors. Uh, so you always have something new to look forward to, essentially. Exactly. What's been your favorite so far over the past year and a half? I think my favorite was the Blood Orange Hefeweizen beer, uh, wow. probably about half a year ago. It was excellent. It had a citrusy sort of yep. blood orange flavor to it. Yeah, yeah, it really was very flavorful. Have you ever submitted yourself to, uh, to have a beer? No, I have, I have not. Uh, I've been meaning to at some point, but so far I've just been voting. What do you think about the beer? Have you, what's your favorite one so far? The favorite one is still to be brought out. It's going to be the Mr. T, because that's my recipe. But, oh, uh, you, you won! I won one of them, yeah. No kidding. Yeah. All right, this takes things to a whole new level now. Do you think this is a really cool, unique sort of model that's going to catch on in other capacities? I truly believe so, because you see it in, in just overall beer forums. Uh, like I said on Facebook, there's different ones, and everybody's trying to do something different with different ingredients. I mean, right. there's, there's always something that you can try out. 
uh, and they really do something different. I mean, I, when I heard about the carrot beer, I was like, why would you do that? But then I tried it and I was like, it was really awesome. So um, getting all different flavors and put them together into a very solid beer, that's, that's a big challenge, but I think the public is also willing to taste it because yeah. it's something new. So I can go onto your website, I can find a beer, I can click it, pay for it, and it'll be shipped to my doorstep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's two ways. One is through the voting round. The voting round happens from the 1st to the 21st of each month. Okay. We take the beers that are on our website, people cast their vote by making a potential pre-order of that beer. Okay. So if they want that one, they'll say, yeah, I'll pay 25 bucks for this if it wins. People rally back and forth, you know, some guys will you know, blast it out to their whole group of friends, like, hey, this is my beer, let's get this win, you know, make this one win. Sweet. And then once the vote round closes, then we ship the beer out. Is this a tech company or is it a brewery? It's both. It's somewhere in between. It's both. Obviously, social media is, I mean, they thought it was a fad when it first came out and then it, yeah. it survived the fad stage. It's a very solid way to do business and if you're on the front end of it, sort of like we are, being, being advanced users of it and, and taking advantage of everything that it offers, you can sort of adapt to the new ways that social media is evolving. So nice. within like two days of us putting a beer out on the market, we have hundreds of check-ins. And awesome. so we can see that, oh, this, this beer is getting like consistent four-star ratings. This is one that we got to keep brewing and make again. And versus some others that get a little bit weird, some people are, you know, <laughs> well, this was a cool idea, but the ghost peppers were really spicy, you know, if they don't like spicy things. Yeah, or some ghost people peppers. are, spicy yeah, pepper you said this was planet. ghost peppers, this isn't even hot. <laughs> so it's, you know. It's an outlet for people to sort of tweak our, our, our beers. And so we, we can take note of that and be like, oh, if we're going to make this again, we should maybe tone down the hazelnuts or, mm -hmm. you know, bring up the pepperness or something sure. like that. The word crowdsourcing is a combination of crowd and outsourcing and was coined by Jeff Howe in a 2006 Wired Magazine article. What has been the biggest hardship that you guys have had to face over the course of this? Oh man, my, my hardest one was making this guy quit his job like two days ago. <laughs> two days ago, congrats. I literally quit on Friday, yeah. So, How's it feel? Um, it was scary. I have to say that, and that's Why? probably the biggest hardship is because you don't know what's going on. You no longer have a fallback. You don't have a steady paycheck. That's a true full belief in it is when you are willing to put your, your own skin in the game. Yeah, yeah. it kind of gave me shivers a little bit like, I don't know what's going to happen, but let's make it happen. Well, two days in, you must be really confident now that everything's <laughs> perfect. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what advice do you have to other entrepreneurs, people in entrepreneur programs or not, yep. incubators or not, <laughs> so maybe just the kid that uh, hates his job and would love to do anything else? What advice do you have for these people? So I have, I have three nuggets. Three One nuggets. Okay. is that let your passions drive you. I've never been successful at a business that it hasn't been driven by something that I really love. Yes. Two is that it's a lot of work. Your job, it's not easier to be an entrepreneur. No, no. We're here for 18 hours a day, consistently. You know, so it takes a lot of work and you gotta be ready for that and be ready to make that commitment. Yep. And the third one is create a minimum viable product. Explain you know, what you mean by that. So you don't wanna stress yourself out about how do I build this thing to be perfect so it can be sold. As quickly as you can, acquire your customers with the product that they will buy and establish that you can sell it. Well, thank you so much for your time. Likewise, time for product samples. Yes, yes, yes. definitely. <laughs> There are a million ways to start a business, but how did Mobcraft do it? Let's find out. They started with a combined $30,000 in the bank and a credit score of 750. They earned $56,000 in their first year, operating at a slight loss. They spent around $280,000 to open their business that they acquired through a private investor and ironically, a crowdfunding campaign. And the one word that Henry, Andrew, and Giotto would use to describe what it takes to make it in business is passion. You need to be wise to be a good entrepreneur. And when opportunity knocks, you have to be there to answer the poor. Success can be hard to swallow, but at yeast you know that you're brewing up a tasty future. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for Mobcraft. Did I write a business plan? I think I did, and it was scribbled on the back of a napkin or something like that. I think I had business goals. I wouldn't say that I wrote a business plan. I didn't have financial intelligence at that time, and I really didn't know how to write a business plan, but I had goals. How important is it? It's extremely important. They say that 90% of entrepreneurs never look at the business plan after the day of writing it, but at least they've set a standard on what they think is their level of accomplishment. 
Next time on Startup, we head to Atlanta, Georgia to talk to Alex, a tenacious and environmentally conscious entrepreneur who created Eco-Friendly Maid Service, a cleaning company that manufactures cleaning products from organic and raw ingredients. Then we head over to St. Louis to meet with Mike, a longtime service industry professional and pinball fanatic who started Orbit, a unique pinball lounge with a twist. Be sure to join us next time on Startup. Yeah, let's do another option for you. Okay. See, this might be a little bit more your color. This one fits perfect. Oh, it feels good too. Like it was made for you? I feel very free. What? So I know we're on opposite sides of the fence, but why do you always got to balk about what you do, huh? American Express is proud to support Startup and the millions of small businesses that put in the hard work to be open for business in neighborhoods across the country. The Chevrolet Volt, an everyday electric car with gas for longer trips. The nature of things to come. Oh, Chevrolet, find new roads. The American small business was built on one thing, relationships. And every time a customer walks through the door, a new one begins. Pay Anywhere was built to help entrepreneurs do what they do best. So keep loving what you do. Just get paid for it. Pay Anywhere. It all starts with an idea, and everyone has them. In the world of business, where you choose to take your idea determines where your idea will take you. Baker College is proud to support startups and those who dare to share their ideas with the world.